Hello, this is Mr. Seymour, and we're going to talk to in this lesson about uh, campaigns and voter behavior, basically elections. And what we're going to do is focus a lot on uh, looking at presidential campaigns, because that tends to be the focus of what voters see as the most important campaigns, even though that may not necessarily be true, we sit, tend to see them as the most important campaigns that we participate in. So let's go on ahead and get started. All right, so the chapter is going to discuss campaigns and voting behavior. The objective here is that we understand exactly how someone runs for elected office at the federal level, particularly the President of the United States. We need to understand a little bit about how the um, primary uh, and caucus process works for the selection of nominees. We're going to look at the entire system from beginning to end in terms of um, how a nominee is selected and what the process is. So let's go on ahead and uh, get started. This is a chart that shows us uh, basically the process of um, how someone becomes a uh, presidential candidate and gets elected to be president. And um, it starts It starts here with um, the requirement. How does one become president of the United States? And uh, you have to be a natural born citizen. You have to be a minimum of 35 years of age. And you have to have been a resident of the United States for 14 years. So national, uh, natural, natural born citizen and a minimum of see if I can get the drawing to work here. Natural born citizen, minimum of 35 years old, U.S. resident 14 years. There was a lot of um, discussion about President Obama and his uh, eligibility and uh, whether or not he was indeed a natural born citizen. And he was born in Hawaii officially. There are some that say that he might have been born in um, Africa. But in either case, he's born to a mother who's an American citizen, naturalized, not, not just naturalized, natural born. So regardless of um, where he was born, if he's born to an American mother, he's an American. He's considered a natural born citizen. And so all of the discussion about his eligibility really was a moot question, but it made for a lot of exciting discussion amongst conservatives who opposed the election of the president. All right, um, step one, you have your primaries and caucuses. Primary here, and then this is the caucus. Um, a primary means that you um, actually officially vote for who you want your nominee to be within the party. But, uh, and, and we narrow down the selection. So we may have more than one primary. Uh, you might have 15, 20 people running in the primaries and you'll narrow it down to a few candidates and then after that you'll narrow it down to the one that is going to be elected or selected by the party. The other is the caucus, which is basically a meeting. Usually this is in smaller states and what happens is uh, you go into a church or a school or a meeting house, a town hall, and you basically raise your hand or stand up for the candidate of your choice. Now in Texas, in the Democratic Party side, we actually have what they call the Texas Two-Step, two and that actually means that uh, we have both the, a, a primary and a caucus, and um, that is a little different but it works in, within the Democratic Party in Texas. It doesn't. We don't have it for the Republicans, but we do for the Democrats. Now, uh, the, the other thing about primaries and caucuses is you have to remember that there are these things called open primaries and closed primaries and blanket primaries. And uh, if you remember a little bit about the um, political party system that we looked at, a pr open primary means that you can just walk in and uh, participate in any of the primary elections you want as long as it's one. So you walk in and you choose to stand in line for the Republicans or the Democrats. You don't have to register or indicate ahead of time. 
On a closed primary, you're only allowed to vote if you have uh, selected that party ahead of time. So that would be closed. And then in a blanket primary, everybody's on one ballot and you just choose. Okay. So uh, candidates from each of the political campaigns, par, uh, campaigns throughout the country have to win a certain number of delegates, which is going to happen here. Then those delegates, um, pa after the caucus and primary uh, campaigns are over, we get to the state and uh, the national conventions, which is over here. And in the national convention, then we're going to choose the one candidate that each of the parties like. And so now you're going to have two candidates running against each other for the major parties. And then you might have a few independents or third parties if they've had enough uh, votes to get on the ballot in every state. And that becomes a problem because you have to get on the ballot in every state. You don't have to do that if you're running for a major political party. Now, once we get past the uh, conventions, then we get over here to the actual campaigning. And this is where things get interesting because before, uh, once you declare yourself a presidential candidate, you do qualify for federal funds. But um, if you take those federal funds, you're going to have some um, specific limitations on what you can do and how you can spend them and how much you can collect from an individual. The political parties themselves are going to support you once you have not uh, been declared as the nominee. Then you have to choose whether or not you're going to uh, actually take those federal funds. This is also where we get into issue-based um, uh, political campaigns and uh, debates. So we're going to have our debates. And so the parties are going to be helping the candidates as they run for office. Plus, you're going to have to have financial assistance. The general election then is held in November, and the two major candidates are going to be the two major parties. And then to get on the ballot in each of the states, because the states control the ballots, you have to have uh, a certain number of signatures on petitions. All right, so our electoral college then becomes the next issue, because when you're voting in, uh, for instance, the state of Texas, it's a winner-take-all scenario. So what happens is for presidential election, we're voting for which party will get or which nominee of the two is going to get the vote, the presidential votes for the state. Then the states meet um, and they get a certain number of electors. It's the, num the number of electors for the entire country is 538. And um, that means that um, 538 electors and Texas has 36. Okay, it's the number of senators you have in the state plus the number, I'm sorry, the number of congressmen you have in the state plus your two senators. Now, the fact that you get the two senators added in makes it important because that means that the smaller states sometimes have uh, an advantage when it comes to uh, getting these, um, these votes. And um, that means that oftentimes the candidates will focus on the smaller states. In any case, whichever of the two candidates gets the majority of the electoral votes wins, if there is a tie, then, this, then the um, full Congress has to decide which of the two candidates will win. Now, the next part here is going to be nomination. The nomination is an official endorsement of a candidate for office by a political party. And uh, success in this, uh, the game, as they call it in the book, requires three M's. The three M's are momentum, money, and media attention. Momentum, money, and media attention.
momentum, money, and media attention. The master plan that guides the candidate's electoral campaign is your campaign strategy. And that's very important. Your campaign strategy is how you intend to win. And that has to start early on with how you're going to win the nomination and then how are you going to um, how are you going to go on ahead and win the presidency? When you're going for the nomination, you're basically in a, a large pool of people competing against each other. When you're going for the uh, presidency, once you're the nominee, then you're representing the political party as a whole. So it's a completely different game. So the idea of nominations is that you have to get the most delegates. And uh, the National Party Convention is where those delegates are, will be assigned eventually. In 1968, there were so many problems with, the, uh, with representation and the fairness of representation in the uh, political parties that the McGovern-Frazier Commission met, was assembled, and um, basically put in some reforms to try to help minority groups get better representation in political parties at the national convention level. Now the other thing that people don't realize is that there are undesignated delegates called superdelegates who basically get to make up their mind either way they want to go. The regular delegates are assigned on the basis of the primaries and caucuses in the states. The superdelegates are those that automatically get a slot as a delegate at the National Party Convention and are independent in their decisions. So the political candidates have to woo the voters and the superdelegates within their party. So here is a picture of the riots that were happening in 1968 at the Democratic National Convention that led to the creation of this commission called the McGovern Fraser Commission. This commission was established because open procedures and affirmative action guidelines were needed for the selection of delegates. And these reforms have made party conventions more representative since 1968. Now, a caucus is a system for selecting convention delegates that's used in about a dozen mostly rural, smaller states where voters show up at a set time and they attend an open meeting to express their presidential preference, uh, as opposed um, the idea of a primary is, in, is an election that's held at the state level and the state pays part of the election cost and the party pays the other part. Presidential primaries then are elections in which the state's voters go to the polls to express their preference for the party's nominee for president. The problem that we've seen is that every state is now competing to get front-loaded and front-loading means that States want to hold their primaries early in the calendar year so that they can get media attention because the, the states will get more attention from the uh, potential, uh, potential nominees, the candidates, those states that hold their primaries early on. The other states tend not to be as important to the candidates, and a lot of states say that's not fair to them. Um, the other thing that you see then after um, or during the process of going for the nomination is your televised debates. You'll have televised debates among the nominees and then televised debates among the candidates. And remember, you're a candidate after you have been given the nomination by your political party. So what are some of the problems of uh, primary and caucus systems? A disproportionate atten amount of attention has gone to early primaries and caucuses, front-loading. Prominent politicians do not run oftentimes. Money plays a huge role. You've got to get the momentum and the money in order to be able to uh, go ahead with the nomination. Also, participation is low and underrepresentative, and too much po uh, power goes to the media. The media focuses so much on the horse race that sometimes they don't focus enough on what message the candidates are trying to get across. Now, this, this chart that is given to you here um, basically is showing you the amount of attention that each of the states got. Texas is the largest state in the country, 
uh, Texas and California. Yet if you look, the ones that got the most attention here were states like Iowa, New Hampshire, Ohio, Indiana. Um, a lot of other states didn't matter at all. Why? Because of the number of delegates um, that they were, they were offering at the national conventions and when the primaries were taking place. So once you get the nomination, then we have the convention send off. This is a rallying point for political parties. And uh, on the first day, you always have a keynote speaker. And that keynote speaker is often going to set the tone for the convention. And they are also kind of a, a nominee in training. These are the people that oftentimes will get the nomination the next go around. They're, they're very vocal people within their political parties and they're getting a lot of attention. Uh, the party platform then is usually decided on the second day of the national convention and this is where the goals and policies for the party as a whole will be decided for the next four years. Then on the third and fourth day the attention goes to the nomination process and by then we usually know who the nominee is going to be because we know how uh, the results of the primaries have been and remember that uh, the regular uh, the regular delegates have to vote for or should vote for the candidates that they've been assigned to. Now what will happen oftentimes is you'll have an overwhelming candidate and then what they'll do is um, throw in their their uh, their delegates to that candidate because they want the candidate to appear to be unanimously selected by the party. So after the nomination comes the campaign itself. You've got really two campaigns going on. One is to become the nominee. Now the other one is going to be backed by your party and that's to become the, to get the office. So you have to have a campaign manager. You have to have a research staff and policy advisors. You hire a pollster. You get a good press secretary and you establish a website. A lot of this is going to now uh, change or switch from uh, being the focus of the candidate now to the party. The party will put their support behind the candidate. He'll use the same staff or she, but at the same time, really now the, can the party puts all of their support behind the candidate. And uh, campaign reforms. The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1974 would create the Federal Election Commission. This is going to provide public financing for presidential primaries and general elections. It limits the presidential campaign spending and it requires disclosure and the limitation of contributions. But it doesn't apply in its entirety unless the, the uh, candidate has selected to take the federal money coming from the Federal Election Campaign Act. And the money is actually given through the uh, through taxes. You when you pay your taxes, you decide whether or not you want to delegate a certain amount of your money. And I think it's five dollars now or six that's going to go to uh, split between the two major parties for uh, the election. Uh, if you don't take that money, then the requirements are a little less on your fundraising, but you still have uh, a lot of laws regarding how you fundraise. Um, then we get to the idea of what soft money is. And soft money is a contribution for political party building expenses or generic party advertising, and it's not subject to contribution limits. In 2002, the McCain-Feingold Act banned soft money and increased the amount of individual contributions and limited issue ads, but it applies to the candidate. It does not apply to things like PACs, political action committees. And this is where we get into um, the Citizens United case where uh, if you have a super PAC or a PAC behind you and you're not directly affiliated with that PAC, you basically, they, they can do all kinds of things to support you. These are called 527 groups. 527 groups are independent groups that seek to influence the political process, but they're not subject to contribution limits because they don't directly seek to elect a particular candidate. They are more oriented towards particular um, goals and objectives 
uh, with, in, with regard to issues. But the problem is you can, you can set up a political action committee and they get First Amendment rights to spend as much as they want and collect as much as they want and support the candidate as long as they are not directly affiliated with that candidate. So political action committees are funding vehicles that were created by the 1974 campaign finance reforms. A corporation, a union, or some other interest group can create a political action committee and they can register it with the Federal Election Commission. There were 4,611 PACs in 2007-2008 election cycle and those PACs contributed $412.8 million to House and Senate candidates. Political action committees donate to candidates who support their issue. So they expect something in return. They do not buy those candidates, but they give the candidates the support, those candidates who uh, they feel are going to support them in the future. In other words, they are buying the candidate, just not officially. It's, it's a very contentious situation. So the question is, does money buy you victory? The more that incumbents spend, the worse oftentimes they do when they face a tough opponent because they have to raise more money to meet that challenge. There is something called a doctrine of sufficiency. You need to spend enough money to get the message across to compete effectively, but if you spend too much money, it's perceived that you're buying the election and people will not support you. So what is the role of the media? The me uh, media coverage is determined by how candidates use their advertising budget. And what happens is if you're getting media coverage, if they're following you and you're on the evening news every day in your campaign, you don't have to buy that media coverage. That's free media coverage and they don't have to give you necessarily equal time. Uh, 2008 media camp uh, campaign media coverage had far more stories about the race between the candidates than the strategies that, and policies that those uh, candidates were using. And part of that is because of equal time laws. So they focus more on who's winning. And oftentimes that, that sets up a signal for voters who then follow that candidate. They want to back the right horse. So if you look here, over 50% of the coverage in the 2008 general election was about the horse race. And if you look at personal issues, public records, um, and policy and strategy, it's much less focused. Only 20% of the media attention was on the policies that these candidates were actually proposing. So there are, campaigns have three major effects on the voter. One is a reinforcement effect which is that voters are reinforced, their preferences for candidates are reinforced by the message they get from the candidate. So the candidates reach out and they, they, pre they preach to the choir, so to speak. They try to get them to understand why they're being supported. Another is to activate. That means that you want voters to contribute money and go out there and ring doorbells and make phone calls and do all the things that are necessary to support you. Then the third effect is conversion which is to try to get voters to change their minds. And that's a lot tougher. So there are also factors that tend to weaken a campaign's impact on voters. And one of those factors is selective perception. That means most attention to, uh, uh, goes to the things that people agree with and um, people interpret events according to their predispositions. If I know that you're a Republican candidate and I tend to vote Democratic, I may, I'm not going to listen to your message. I'm going to see that you're a Republican candidate. So it's a lot harder for me to support you and vice versa. Party identification, therefore, influences the behavior of voters. And another thing is, if you're an incumbent, you have name recognition, a track record, and usually you'll have those PACs supporting you because they know uh, which way you tend to vote when it comes to important issues. And this is, of course, for a congressional election, but also uh, they tend to know which way um, a, a presidential candidate is going to steer. Just as a reminder, the term suffrage means the legal right to vote, which was gradually extended to virtually all citizens over the age of 18 using the Constitution, starting with the 14th Amendment and moving forward. Now, whether or not a citizen decides 
they're going to vote is a different story. Anthony Downs says that people who see policy differences between the parties are more likely to vote. So if I see distinct differences between the two political parties, I'm going to be more likely to support one candidate over another. Otherwise, I don't care. Also, if I feel that my vote doesn't count anyway, that is an issue of political efficacy, which is the belief that your vote matters. If you believe your vote matters and can make a difference, you're more likely to vote. If uh, the third reason why you would tend to vote is you believe it to be your civic duty, and that usually comes from lessons that have been taught to you by your parents and your family, but it can also come from your belief that you're doing the right thing by participating in the voting process. So in order to vote, you have to register. And voter registration change, uh, changes just a little bit between each state. A voter registration is a system adopted by the states that requires voters to register prior to voting. The Motor Voter Act of 1993 does require that states have to permit people to register to vote when they apply for their driver's license and in other uh, circumstances. And uh, when you go and apply for your driver's license and you are at least three months away from your 18th birthday, if you're within three months of your 18th birthday and you will be 18 on the day of election, you are qualified to register to vote for that election. And they will ask you. So who tends to vote? Education tends to be a very important factor. People with higher education vote more than people with lower levels of education. Age is a factor. The older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Race is a factor. Racial minorities are usually underrepresented among voters relative to the size of their citizenry. In other words, if you are a male and you are um, African American or Hispanic and you are undereducated and you are young, you're very likely not to vote. If you are uh, a female and you have a high level of education and a high level of income and you're older and you're white, you're very likely to vote. Young people have one of the lowest rates of election turnout, so Rock the Vote has been an important campaign going on for over 30 years now, trying to get young people to go out there and participate in the election process. And this is P. Diddy at a Rock to Vote uh, event. Gender. Women participate more in elections than men do. And married people vote more than unmarried people. And government employees tend to vote more often than not. And that's because they have a lot to lose if they don't participate. And that becomes the bottom line to all of this. The more you have to lose, the more likely you are to participate in the voting process. The less you feel effective, the less you feel like you have to lose, the less you participating you're going to do. But then a young person who's receiving uh, benefits from the federal government is has a lot to lose if, if um, he doesn't or she doesn't participate, yet they don't perceive that as, as being the truth. And that is something that uh, education... Uh, and age tend to um, alter over time, but getting young people to understand that they have to vote is very, very important. So this is a turnout rate chart. Uh, highest rates of turnout, 65 and over in your age groups, 18 to 24 is the lowest. Those with no high school diploma have the lowest turnout rate. Those with advanced degrees have the highest. White non-Hispanics have the highest turnout rate, Native Americans have one of the lowest, and the Asian Americans have the lowest. Um, men tend to uh, participate or vote less than women do. Married people vote more than single people do. And government workers are the one occupation that tends to vote more than any of the others. Students vote and unemployed people vote the least. Possessing several of those traits at the same time will either increase or decrease your, your, your likelihood to vote, and it adds significantly. Um, conversely, being young, poorly educated, and single is likely to add up to a very low probability of you voting. And we know this. We can see it. But then again, who really has more to lose? Um, it all depends on your perspective. Now, the mandate theory. 
oftentimes candidates will claim that they have a mandate. A mandate is the idea that uh, the people have somehow sent an, a message that says that what they stand for is so important that they, they elected this person in in an overwhelming majority. And politicians uh, like the, uh, the theory that they have a mandate more than political scientists do. Political scientists don't believe that there's a real mandate theory out there. It's very rare. Uh, party identification is very important in explaining uh, a person's decision to vote. People still generally vote for a party that they agree with, and parties hold on voters declined in the 60s and 70s with a rise in candidate-centered politics. So that means a rise in independence. Uh, many floating voters make an individual voting decision, and, they, and so those independent floating voters are up for grabs each election, and believe me, both candidates want to get to those people. We have seen changing patterns in voting behavior from 1960 to 2008, and demographic correlations of presidential voting behaviors have changed in a number of areas. Protestants and Catholics voted very differently in part because uh, John Kennedy in the 1960s was voted in through Cath uh, by Catholics and because Catholics were a key element in the Roosevelt era Democratic Convention, uh, Coalition. But now it tends to be more Protestants because the Republican Party especially holds on to a Protestant base. Catholics were only more sli uh, slightly more likely to, to support the Democratic nominee than the Protestants were. Today, major differences among religious lines involves how often you attend uh, services and whether or not uh, you attend on a regular basis. And so whether you're a, uh, a Protestant or, or uh, a Catholic, really doesn't matter as much now because it tends to be more those who tend to attend church regularly tend to be more conservative than those who do not. Um, but it is true that Catholics are slightly more likely to support a Democratic nominee but remember also that uh, Catholics don't support right to life issues uh, or they do support right to life I'm sorry they don't support pro-choice issues and so that tends to be uh, something that has to be considered as well. Um, Obama drew greatly from the African-American community. Um, Democrats also gained support from female voters who preferred Obama uh, over um, the Republican candidates. Finally, Hispanics who tend to support Democratic candidates account for only 1% of voters in 1960, but by, 19, uh, by 2008, 9%. So uh, uh, Hispanics tend to be more Democrat oriented, but their numbers are rising, yet their level of participation still tends to be low. The three most important dimensions of candidate image are the, can the integrity of the candidate, the reliability of the candidate, and the competence of the candidate. Image plays a role in voting when a candidate is perceived to be either incompetent or dishonest. Um, so integrity, reliability, and competence are so very important in what we tend to do. But we still look more at party identification than anything else. Policy voting means that we make our choices on the basis of the message, not the messenger. Electoral choices that are made on the basis of a voter's policy preferences our policy voting, where the candidates stand on policy issues then to a policy voter makes a lot of ch difference. Um, most of us say we're policy voters, but in reality we're very affected by the media and by the political parties themselves and their strategies, and the, the candidates know it. Uh, 2008 was an election that claimed to be about change. Obama's main issue was changing the health care system to extend coverage to everybody. McCain's main issue was making changes to improve the economy and the financial institutions. But um, saying that you stand for change and actually doing it are two very different things. The election, the popular vote was a lot closer than the electoral vote. Obama got 53% of the popular vote in 2008 and McCain got 46%. The electoral vote Obama got 365 elector, uh, electoral votes and McCain got 173. Obama won and he became the first American president. And when he did, it was 
news first front page news that you have an African American president. But the question is, what was he standing for? What policy changes was he going for? And the big one was uh, was insurance, uh, health insurance. That was his biggest stance. But let's take a look here at um, let's take a look at 2008. 2008. Here's Texas, and here is the Midwest. And then this was 2004. Here's the Midwest. Notice that in 2004, a lot more people were voting uh, within the Midwest that, uh, conservatively, because this is the Bible Belt, and this tends to be the center of the country. And in 2008, yeah, uh, two states, New Mexico and Colorado, voted Democratic. But at the same time, um, I'm sorry, they voted, yeah, voted Democratic. Uh, the blue states are Democrat, red states are Republican. But do you notice that there's like a gap between the east and west coasts that tend to be Democratic and the the um, uh, Midwest, which tends to be Republican, and also you have um, the south and southeast tends to be Republican. The Electoral College has been uh, called the last battle. And um, part of it is people don't really understand why we have an electoral college. Uh, and part of it is because of the winner-take-all concentrations that we get from the states. Um, the electoral college is definitely a unique American institution. It was created by the Constitution in order to provide for the selection of the president by a series of electors who would hopefully um, represent the will of the people, yet at the same time protect the will of the people uh, from uh, themselves. Uh, less populated states are overrepresented in the electoral college system because of the uh, senators being included in the number of electoral votes. It is a winner-take-all concentration. 48 out of 50 states have winner-take-all systems. And um, this causes some of the smaller states to get uh, an extreme focus. And it also can mean that you can lose the popular vote and still win the election, which has happened many times. So how does it work? There are electoral votes assigned to each state that equal to the number of members in Congress and um, their two senators. 48 states have winner-take-all systems. Maine and Nebraska do not. State electors vote in December that uh, in the December following the November election, and in January Congress will count the votes and name the president. The House of Representatives picks the president if there is no majority vote. So this is what one of those uh, electoral college uh, votes looks like. Uh, this is Texas. They're voting on the on the floor of the House, and. Um, they're dropping in their ballots for McCain because Texas is a winner-take-all state. So all of the electors, the 38 electors in Texas, would have all voted for McCain. Uh, the less populated states are overrepresented because uh, states get two electors for, this, for the senators regardless of their population. And the winner-take-all uh, focus means that candidates will focus on winning the states where the polls show that there appears to be a close contest. So the question is, are nominations and campaigns too democratic? The campaign is open to almost everyone and consumes a lot of time and money, and it promotes individualism in American politics. But when you get down to the nomination process, that becomes a little different. Um, how about public policy? The greater the policy differences between candidates, we know the more likely voters will be to steer government policy by their choices. Retrospective voting means looking back and asking uh, on a candidate, what have you done for me lately? That means candidates realize that they've got to have some track record to go back to their constituents with and say, look what I've done for you. Otherwise, they won't vote. Do big campaigns lead to an increased scope of government? Candidates make a lot of promises, especially to state and local interests. It's hard for politicians to promise to cut the size of government if people want more from their government and they have to give perks. And lastly, 
Elections generally support government policies in power. Voters feel that they're sending a message to government to accomplish something. And the government expands to fill the needs of voters and to give them back what they think they want them to have. And so it probably does lead to an increased scope of government having the system that we do.